Welcome, and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. I'm your host, Matt Kors, the Director of Supply Growth here at Crexy. And today I'm very excited to sit down with Tavon Moffat and Peter Bauman. I've known these gentlemen for a long time, and, and so I consider them friends. And having them back on the podcast after two years, um, I'm real, I was really excited to get this one moving. A little bit about their backgrounds before we dive in. So Tavon specializes in the acquisition, disposition, and recapitalization of Arizona's institutional office and industrial properties. He has a substantial experience in single-tenant office and industrial investment throughout the United States. He has worked with major investors, including REITs, institutional investors, private equity groups, private capital investors, N31 exchange investors, and foreign investors. Tavon previously worked at JLL, Colliers International, Grubb and Ellis, and Marsha McClellan Companies experience gave him a deep understanding of how corporations approach space requirements and utilization throughout the United States. He earned his Master's of Corporate Real Estate from Coronet Global and his Bachelor's of Arts from University of Pennsylvania. Bond's also a member of NAOP and ICSC. Peter Ballman is Senior Director of the Institutional Property Advisors, IPA, a select division of capital market experts at Marcus & Millichap. Specialized in the sale, purchase, recapitalization, industrial, medical, office, and retail properties throughout the U.S. Peter has sold over $2 billion worth of assets nationwide throughout his career. He and his team focus primarily in the Southwest, however, are experts throughout the entire country. He's an expert in maximizing value for clients by assisting institutional and private capital. Prior to IPA, Peter worked at JLL and Colliers International, specializing in investment sales on a national basis. During his tenure at JLL, he helped establish and build their corporate finance division. While at Colliers, he chaired the net lease practice group and was on the board of leadership committee. He is defined as an industry leader across office and industrial product types. He is consistently a top producer for both JLL and Colliers, and he holds his real estate licenses in Arizona and Nevada. Gentlemen, it's great to sit down with you both today. How are you doing? Great, Matt. Fantastic. Uh, great to great to see you. Great to be with you. And uh, hello to the whole Crexy community. Yeah, and thanks for having us on. Yeah, no. Absolutely. I was going to say, I know we saw each other briefly in Vegas about 30 days ago at ICSC, but um, how was the show for you both? Figured to start there. Was, was it a good one? Yeah, I mean, the, the show was great. It was a short-lived trip. I had several different office assets on the market and had to assist with different fire tours while that show was going on. So I was popping back and forth between Summerlin and the Strip. And it was great to see, you know, old friends, clients, and peers in the industry. It was active. And a lot of people there, people that were very focused and a lot of uh, agreements being made with various transactions, a very positive environment and a lot of excitement, a lot of people very realistic, uh, with the dynamics in the marketplace, but, um, people were excited to be out. And uh, I think the show was very well received. Yeah, I love to hear that. I thought we, we felt the same at Crexy. The, our booth was always busy and, um, it just felt good to be in an environment like that again, in person, I, I, I feel like. But with all that, let's dive in because we've got a lot to cover today. Um, I know we just covered your backgrounds, but I'd love to explore it a little bit in further detail. Um, maybe how each of you got into commercial real estate and what drew you to industrial. And Peter, maybe I'll call on you. I know we didn't go through your educational background, but I believe you started in geology and oceanography, if I remember correctly. So how that, that kind of morphed into the CRE world. No, that, 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 that is true. So undergrads in oceanography and, and geology. Uh, you know, and, and so coming out of university, I, I did exploration geology work in West Africa as a field geologist and ran an ex exploration team for a, a gold mining company. And, and so my main responsibility with that job was evaluating land resource deposits. So dumbing that down a little bit, looking for gold in the dirt and what is the economics to extract the gold from the top dirt to get to the dirt that pays money. Right. And so if you take that model, you flip it upside down, you got real estate. So that was, uh, that's the, the easy way to transition from exploration geology into investment property sales, but no, on, on a more serious level, there's a lot of economics that go into that same, same with commercial real estate with underwriting and Argus modeling, 
when you're when you're evaluating land resources, you have to be very selective about what you're going to extract and where that mine plan is going to go and how you and how you approach the mine plan for processing. I, I can I understand that a little bit, not too much, but I, I see how that gets into the real estate side. Thanks for for dumbing it down for us out there, Devon. How about yourself? I feel like it's may, maybe more uh, on the commercial real estate path versus going into that, but but I like I like both. Uh, I like I like that answer, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I I started my career out of college doing management strategy operations consulting, and so I was working with a lot of corporations. Then had the opportunity to go in house. I uh, work on the executive side with a Fortune 500 company. And I'd always had a fascination with commercial real estate and decided to, to go into brokerage. And so what attracted me to industrial office was I was, I was used to understanding how uh, corporations use their space and, and need their space. And that's what, I, that's what I knew. That's what I was interested in. That's what I was attracted to. And I, I think that's, that's really a really important element for people that, you know, are, are evaluating going into the industry is it's, if you're, if you're going to devote your, your time, your energy, your passion, make that investment, uh, it's, it's, it's really critical to figure out what, what area of specialization you want to have in this business. You can't do, you can't do everything. Uh, and so that's, that's what I knew. That's what I was interested in. And, and, you know, that's, that's where I sought to dedicate my efforts and energy and passion. I think you guys, uh, I think that paid off pretty well for you, especially now with the, in the industrial market. That's for sure, gentlemen. Um, how, how about, how about, how did you guys meet and decide to form a partnership from there? How about that side of things? Yeah, great question. So uh, I met Tavon prior to getting into commercial real estate. Uh, you know, when I was, I was considering it as a, as a, you know, occupational change, getting out of exploration geology and uh, relocating back to Arizona, I, I connected with several different professionals in the Phoenix market and Devon happened to be one of those first contacts that I made there and we stayed in touch. And then when I, m I moved to Phoenix, um, you know, I was, I was looking at different opportunities at the time after getting licensed and talking to different firms, got offers from CB, got offers from Cushman, Lean Associates and Tavon was at, at Collier's and at that point in time, you know, that firm seemed like the, the right fit and Tavon seemed like a great, a great mentor to make that transition from, you know, a, a business that was not associated directly with real estate and transition into investment properties. But I, I guess that makes a lot of sense. That's for sure. Um, and, and it's, it's interesting to see you guys, obviously over the years, like I said, I've known you since correct. has been around for seven years and, and, um, I guess that you were with Collier's probably when we met you and then JLL and now, now IPA. So that's, um, it's interesting to bring it back that far. How about like lessons early on that you, that you both learned and a, kind of a question I like that you brought up Peter, uh, or, uh, a thought you brought up is on the mentorship side of things too, like mentors maybe you had early on. Uh, and things like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I mean, I think, I think it's important that you know, someone coming into the business surround themselves by, um, people that are ready, willing, and able to guide them, um, to provide mentorship, to provide leadership, to, uh, give them a path to be able to help people spread their wings and grow and learn. And, and it's a very complicated space and industry. And, uh, you know, you just can't go in and, and fake it till you make it. You need to be surrounded by you know, people that you're working directly with. You need to have people that you can, you can talk to and, and have mentors, uh, along the way. So I think that it's, it's having that core group around you. Um, I think that, you know, the challenge in the marketplace is there aren't really a lot of uh, great avenues where people have a formalized structure. And that's what's really exciting with the organization that we're at now. Uh, and, and we have just a, a very robust uh, training program through the Marcus and Millichap organization. Uh, I wish I had that starting out. You know, I did, we didn't have that. I had great people that were uh, mentoring me and, and guiding me. 
but you know, you have to be, you have to be ultra dedicated to the craft that you're going to be pursuing. Uh, you have to, you have to ensure that you are committed to it, that you're going to put the time, effort, energy, legwork, the blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, but you do need a good core group around you to help, to help teach you, to help guide you, to help solve problems and really enable, uh, success as you find opportunities and can see everything through fruition. Yeah. I've got a couple of crystal ball questions coming up later on. And we might, we might go back into that one. Um, but I, I, I yeah, I want to, I want to come back to that later, but diving into the industrial space in particular guys, cause I know that's what everyone wants to hear about today. Um, let's kind of discuss how the last few years have treated the sector. Uh, I, I just know from living in Los Angeles, seeing, you know, everything going out into the desert industrial um, because there's no space left. It looks like it's experienced a boom during these times, especially with the pandemic. But can you guys share kind of more about that and what you see in your, in your, you know, focus areas? It's been a perfect storm. So, you know, you, you mentioned it, there's very low vacancy in terms of uh, space generally around the entire country. Uh, but you look at California being a very critical industrial market because of, of ports, because of population, because of disseminating product. You look at the Inland Empire and you've got sub 1% vacancy. In a lot of places around the country, you've got you know, sub 1% or, or vacancy around that level. And as it relates to, I mean, we sit in Phoenix. So as you look at Phoenix and other areas in the Southwest, um, there's not a lot of land left in California. It can be very difficult to entitle and develop assets. Uh, and there's other kind of economic factors too, which might not make it as attractive. And so Arizona has been a, a fast growing industrial market for logistics. You know, we're seeing other factors at play of onshoring manufacturing and, and other areas. So we've got great infrastructure. Uh, great economic factors with labor, with business operation costs. And so we've seen an astronomical level of development, but what's most important is that we have the underlying critical nature of tenant demand and we have rent growth and uh, the market's been very mature on its own. And so while we've seen off the record charts in terms of development, uh, the lease up of space, the absorption of space has been ahead of where development uh, has been occurring. And um, so a lot of companies have been ahead of the curve. Obviously, yeah, you know, we all recognize that the pandemic changed a lot of behaviors and necessitated increased demand. Uh, people in terms of corporations were probably a little bit behind the curve in terms of growth and development. So it's really, it's been an exciting time. It continues to be an exciting time. Uh, we're very cognizant of, of what's going on in the marketplace, but uh, underlying factors uh, remain very positive in the sense that tenant demand is strong, rent growth is strong. Uh, the cost for construction uh, has gone up considerably. Land costs have gone up considerably and land is more and more scarce. Uh, but it, it remains just a, an absolute uh, great time in the industrial space and sector. Yeah, and I would add to that too. So all the same trends that you're seeing in Phoenix and in Arizona, you're experiencing those trends more, more or less across the Sun Belt states. And, you know, Phoenix and Las Vegas especially has, has really capitalized on that boom in industrial activity from the spillover of the ultra low vacancy in the Inland Empire and uh, Los Angeles County due to the proximities of those two municipalities and MSAs of the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And so, you know, just just like Phoenix, Las Vegas has, has been a, a tremendous beneficiary of, of industrial growth. It's a, it's a three and a half, four hour drive from the Port of LA. A lot of people don't realize it, that Las Vegas is that close. The difference between Vegas and, and Phoenix is that it's land constrained. A lot of people don't understand that either, right? And so there's not a lot of land to develop. And so there is a finite resource there and it's been a massive land grab and you're seeing, you know, developments come underway and they're 90% leased uh, 
from a speculative development just due to tenant activity. And so we don't we don't see a slowdown in those two sub markets in the Southwest in the next three to five years, just just due to the the ultra low vacancies and the the economic factors of why all the migration has been happening into those two states due to you know the the various economic factors that California brings to its residents and businesses. It's also very interesting too, as you look at it. I mean, in, industrial hasn't been favored nation status uh, for a long time. And while there's been rent growth, rents have been fairly stagnant. Land values have been fairly stagnant. Construction costs have been fairly stagnant. Uh, and so, you know, there was, there was significant investment activity. There was significant investor interest. Uh, there was significant interest in the space, in the sense that, you know, depending on a brand new class A industrial project, for the most part, it's, it's fairly generic. You can get into all different nuances, but there's not as much of a challenge in terms of if tenant A leaves, making it adaptable for tenant B, uh, where you could have more, much higher fixed costs with other asset classes like uh, office. And so there's there's been interest in that. Um, what you know, Peter and I both alluded to. I mean, you 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 have circumstances right now in industrial with current projects where space might not even be completed, and it's coming online and it's underway with construction right now. You might have two, three, four, five tenants jockeying for that space. Uh, so there's you know the demand is just uh, superb and substantial, and um, it, you know it's just it's just a unique it's a unique time in our marketplace and, and, uh, uh, for a whole factor of reasons, which we'll probably cover more. I mean, we, we continue to see demand just being very robust, um, and continuing on, even if there are economic headwinds. Yeah. And I, I would say too, like I, not being an expert in the space by any means, but I, I drove from, um, Los Angeles to Las Vegas for ICSC this year. And I couldn't believe like the amount of of activity Vegas has seen just to talk about Vegas like you guys were. I mean, it's crazy how, how, like you mentioned Summerland earlier, I think, but it's just growing like all over the place there for industrial. I, I, I just saw boxes going up everywhere, you know, big boxes, um, which kind of brings me to my next point. Like, do you guys see like specific, like a, a warehouse distribution? Is that like the biggest right now just because of e-commerce and stuff like that? Or is it, is it all across the board? Like, you know, you mentioned onshore manufacturing and stuff too. We're, we're seeing a renaissance across different areas of the, the industrial space. Uh, distribution, logistics uh, remains by far the biggest avenue and, and the most important sector. But because of how... Um, consumer behaviors have changed. Uh, we're, we're seeing the maturity and other facets of the industrial sector that have been overlooked in the past. And you know, that, that includes uh, refrigerated warehouse space, freezer warehouse space, industrial outdoor storage space, uh, manufacturing of assets. And in, investors are uh, allocating resources and funds where a lot of it was focused on the generic distribution space. If I lose one tenant, I know I can backfill it easily with another tenant. Uh, I don't. I don't need to worry about it. To people recognizing there's a there's a massive need to uh, either do manufacturing in the United States now to uh, re onshore to recognizing how um, delivery uh, delivery methods have changed and needing more area for outdoor storage, van storage, transport, um, and so all these factors. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's private capital interest, there's institutional interest, there's additional funds being raised, um, to all these different areas. And so it's, it's, it makes it a lot of fun. I think what's fascinating too, is, is all these trends were happening, just not at the pace that they are now pre-pandemic, right? And so people have been talking about the Southwest and Sunbelt mar markets and being close to major ports and the, the peripheral states that are going to take advantage of that. But th that was always, I don't want to say like theory, it was just a, a slow progress, right? And then the pandemic hit, places shut down, and all of a sudden it was like all these different companies felt like 
from a logistics side and warehouse side and e-commerce side and distribution were left with their pants down, right? And all of a sudden it left them exposed. They, they, they saw what globalization does and the issues that exist in supply chain and how that impacts. So now you have like onshoring, you're talking about manufacturing, coming back to the United States, back to Mexico, back to Canada. Right. So it's like, so, so that acceleration happened and I don't, I don't see it going back to leaving everything up to, you know, Southeast Asia and China to be the sole producer of, you know, all the goods across the world. Yeah. People, I mean, some people may know it, some people might not know it, but uh, everyone has seen the headlines with the congestion at the ports. So everyone recognizes that. Not everyone realizes the cost for all those containers um, skyrocketed exponentially, beyond exponentially. Uh, it was it was a massive increase, and and costs have settled back down somewhat now. Um, and and delivery times are are speeding up, but they're still at record levels. And so. You know, there's also geopolitical risks and that are that are out there that people are concerned about. So like what Peter was saying, people are looking at, you know, whether they're coming to the U.S., people are looking at Mexico. It's obviously a lot easier and quicker to get uh, goods up, transported via a truck from Mexico. And they're going to look at other areas across the Americas as well. So a lot of a lot of uh, innovation is still happening, time and attention. But. Um, you know, we're going to see continued demand for these Sunbelt states in terms of the logistic transport, because as we're getting more and more cargo coming over uh, via, you know, via trailer, it's going to be coming up through Arizona. It's going to be coming up through Texas and, and other areas as we as we get, you know, even more manufacturing happening in, in Mexico and other areas of uh, uh, Central America and, and, and potentially in South America. I didn't, I didn't think about all that. You guys put it in a, a different perspective for me. That's, uh, that kind of blew my mind there. I like that a lot. Um, We're in know, the leads on it. it yeah. It, it, so yeah, you guys are, yeah, exactly. Especially Arizona. I, I, you know, I didn't realize how poor of a location, um, you know, geography wise that, that is too, uh, with, with everything that's going on. Um, are, and I, I, I've got a lot of different questions I could ask there, but I guess like one that I would, I would, I would go to is like investor appetite for this all this stuff has got to be huge right so are, are you guys seeing is it is it strictly an institutional type people or is everybody trying to get in the game now if you've got you know a 1031 buyer that held on to an apartment building for 30 years do they want to try to get into the game and um and our business is trying to buy buildings versus lease them so is, is all is all this type of stuff happening out there it's 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 really seen as a safe safe space so it's seen as a safe okay. space because of um, the, you know, the, the flexibility, uh, and adaptability of the product, and then also with rent growth. So we're, we're seeing it, we're seeing investor interest on the private capital and institutional capital side come from all different spectrums. It's coming, it's coming heavily from multifamily. Uh, but we're also seeing it come from other areas. Maybe people are selling retail assets and that might be single tenant retail. It might be higher cap multi-tenant retail. Uh, they might be selling hospitality assets, land, uh, other areas. They're seeking to get into uh, the industrial space. And then there are people that have had assets for a long time and they may be selling them or refinancing and getting capital and coming into the industrial space. So we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing demand uh, come from all different, all different sectors. We're seeing institutional capital being raised at, at very large clips. Uh, to be able to deploy into the industrial sector. Uh, so there's there's a lot of interest. Uh, there's the money's disciplined. Um, investor interest is disciplined, but you know there's 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 significant capital allocations coming into the sector. I think what's really interesting too is that during the great financial crisis, that the industrial sector was was one of the the bigger hit sectors in addition to the office market at that point in time and, and how that conversion from, you know, not being in the limelight to being in the limelight through 
the trends that existed in, you know, 17, 18, 19, but then just completely accelerated and went on a hockey stick model exponentially with, with the demand from investor interest. And, you know, it was really attractive for Tavon and I, when we got recruited over to, to run institutional property advisors, Southwest division for office and industrial and, and realizing being at Marks and Millchap, having the relationships with the institutional clientele and being able to marry that up with the private capital community, which Marks and Millchap 100% commands. It, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see the amount of capital that flows all across the country through this firm, not just on the institutional side, but even more so on the private capital side. And the reason why that is important is that as, as the cost of capital rises in a, in a rising interest rate environment, private capital isn't, isn't constrained to the same metrics the institutions are when purchasing any asset class, right? And so being able to access that capital is what helps us in a market like today, that when you're experiencing a transition into, into providing clients surety of close execution and commanding pricing that is still relevant in today's market. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. I, and I didn't think about the whole, what you guys pull together at, at IPA with the Marcus and Melchap backbone there. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Another kind of a follow-up question to that, metro-wise, I know we're talking about, or not necessarily metro-wise, but you know, location-wise, the Southwest, the Sunbelt states, um, is it is the same appetite, would you say, across the country, though, in third-tier markets? Or I know I mentioned L.A. I, I just moved to Chicago recently and driving up and down the freeway to get down to the city because I'm in the burbs. I mean, these boxes, again, are popping up everywhere. So I'm assuming, you know, no matter where you're at, if it's large or small, it's probably pretty popular right now. Yeah, it's absolutely a nationwide trend. I mean, it's, it, we're, we're seeing we're, we're seeing a lot of areas where I- investors necessarily haven't been focused in on certain markets, and uh, it, it's it's almost like no stones left unturned because there are certain markets that maybe institutional investors overlooked. There were private capital players that kind of dominated the marketplace, but assets were trading at higher cap rates, and so people are saying, "Oh my God." You know, I'm paying this incredibly aggressive low cap rate in this market. I can go get a better yield in this market. I've got, you know, a sticky tenant. I've got a great distribution user, whatever the case may be, but they can get better yields. Um, And look at, we're a huge country. You know, you still have to have a distribution network. You still have to be able to service the population across the country. And we saw it at the get-go from Amazon. Amazon, you know, immediately announced uh, at the beginning of the pandemic that they were reinvesting all their profits to go build out a very robust and even, even more of what they already had a robust network, but an even more robust, uh, servicing network to the entire country and, and other people are following. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it, we're seeing it in, in secondary tertiary markets, other markets. I mean, there's significant rent growth, um, especially, you know, on the manufacturing side in tertiary markets. Uh, we're we're seeing growth across the chart, so it's not unusual, no matter where you are in the country, to be seeing vacancy factors that are uh, sub two percent, sub one percent, and areas where people were necessarily skittish on development. You're getting regional, national development players that are going on into these markets where they haven't been before, and they're saying, "Yeah, we're seeing growth. We're seeing rank growth. We're seeing demand for new product." And so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it, it's a exciting marketplace all over the country. Oh, that, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It, it's uh, eye opening to me. I think, uh, and, and kind of switching terms or switching topics to like the leasing well, landscape, real, real, but I know, I know you guys, oh yeah, go ahead. Real quick, Matt, just to, before we end on like capital flows from yeah. various regions, and we've been talking a little about west into the you know mountain states or southwest region just to give you kind of some stats on what our firm does this is all internal to the ipa and m M&M ecosystem and our our firm moves on an annual basis internally across the country about 26 billion dollars worth of capital placements right and then outbound out of out of the western region so we define the western region as washington oregon and california 
we're moving 9.2 billion of capital out of those states and and investments coming inbound into the mountain states you're looking at five to six billion annually right and then other regions right we track all we track all these metrics across the firm it's it's fascinating so that yeah so capital deployment yeah that that's really that's really interesting stuff to see too where it's where it's coming from but not only that but where it's going to so it's uh, it doesn't surprise me though, to be honest with you. And when, when you're talking about the tertiary, secondary tertiary markets being hot places to look, uh, now it makes a lot of sense. Um, do you, I mean, in, in, if you look at like what's going on in the economy today, cause we've got, uh, a recession coming forthcoming here. Some people say it's been here since, you know, for months now. Um, it sounds like industrials is poised to be good through this. So do you guys see any, you know, pumping on the brakes at all uh, in, in the sector or have you yet so far? I mean, look, it's going to be, it's all going to be a geographic specific asset specific, right? You know, I think, I think one of the sectors that's going to be, you know, that this could, that's going to become softer as a function of it is your long-term fixed income assets as as you continue to get the cost of capital increases right i mean that's it's a math equation um you know cap rates i mean it's it's interesting you know you talk to the buyer community and everybody thinks that there's a hundred percent direct correlation between the fed moving moving rates to you know well that's gotta that's gonna have a a direct correlation to cap rates well you know right now the 10-year treasury is at today this morning i checked it's been fluctuating around 3.25 3.25 to 3.15 recently. You know, in, in 20 in 2018, in November, December, the 10-year treasury was there too. And cap rates on all these asset classes, right? Whether it was multifamily, office, industrial, single tenant, retail, medical, what were they doing? Cap rates were still compressing. And that was a function of investor demand. And so, yes, there are true headwinds out there that people need to be, you know, uh, cognizant of. But at the end of the day, right, it's, it's going to come down to the amount of, uh, the amount of demand and there's been limited supply. So right now we're in a kind of a transitionary period. I don't, I don't have the crystal ball. I don't know how bad inflation is. I mean, I feel it when I go to the, the gas pump, right? I used to fill gas in Arizona for two and a quarter and it's five fifty a gallon, you know, in other States I'm hearing seven bucks a gallon. I mean, that's why I don't live in those States. So. Um, but back to my point is that the Fed's got to get that under control. And if they can't, then, you know, all we can do is look back at historical times and what happened in those, uh, those areas. But at the same time, in a, in an inflationary environment, what asset class performs the best real estate. So it's a great hedge against inflation because you can move rents. And if you have the ability to move rents faster, right. With like near term rollover you're going to be the beneficiary of owning that asset and pushing rents as, as the inflation in your environment continues to increase, right? Cause it all gets passed through, right? If the port's passing it on to the company, the company's passing it on to the consumer, the landlord's passing it on to the tenant, right? It all, it's just a big circular event. And at some point it's going to settle down. And, you know, one thing I do know is that we live in the best country in the world and, you know, it's, it's not going to be that bad. At the end of the day, you know, there's, there's other countries that I've lived in that have it a whole lot worse all the time. So I think everybody just needs to, you know, realize that we'll all get through this together. I don't think it's going to be, you know, a long-term five-year event. I think it's, you know, more episodic in this, in this horizon. Yeah. I think, I think Peter summed it up perfectly. I mean, I think we're, we're dealing with a lot of discipline capital. And I think that, um, you know, people look at certain shock waves and it's important, like Peter said, look at it from a historical context. Um, the, the things that will have an impact are certain elements of development. And so the great thing is, is we have good tenant demand. Uh, we have low vacancy. And so there's, there's a need for the space. We have rent growth that supports development. Uh, so where, where you see that people had in a, a pro forma model, a certain ex- exit cap rate, um, 
you know, it depends on what geographic you're in, but, you know, it could have been X. And as interest rates rise, uh, cap rates, uh, cap rates are going to adjust. So in some elements uh, and in instances, development uh, performance will change and people might say, we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a pause uh, from a development standpoint. But again, you know, you look at, you look at the underlying factors, tenant demand is there. Uh, people are fighting over uh, spaces as they're coming available. Rent growth is, is there. So those are, those are positives. Um, you know, we do need to be cognizant of uh, lenders. Uh, the most real estate transactions are financed. I mean, there's a certain amount of all cash buyers, whether, whether that's private capital or institutional capital. Uh, there could be you know, borrowers that have uh, uh, an easier uh, ability to finance, whether it's, it's public debt, uh, balance sheet debt, uh, credit lines that they have access to, so they're not dependent upon individual transactional level debt. Uh, and so, you know, lenders are behaving in, in different, uh, in different, different standards, but, you know, we just did a call for offers on an industrial project and we had 19 offers on it. Um, and, and that's just indicative of all the projects there, you know, even in a, in a recessionary environment and, uh, a rising cap rate environment, there is a significant amount of robust capital, smart capital, it's disciplined capital but the market's still very fluid and open for business and, and people want this product. Absolutely. And I, I would just echo everything Tavon said, where the, the, the institutions are truly disciplined, right? And I think they're going to, they're going to be driving more, more softening in values and cap rates on, on that institutional asset class, because it is a borrowing cost function. Now, when you, when you, when you migrate in the private capital, there, that, that model isn't, isn't directly related a lot, you know, I would say the majority of the private capital that we experience through the Marks and Millchap platform and have access to from IPA is all 1031 exchange driven where they've, where they've sold out of a multifamily, you know, 35 unit complex, and they're looking to migrate out of something that's management heavy into industrial in the Southwest, right? And, and in that 1031 exchange motivation, you know, that's all tax deferred gains that is motivating that purchase more so than what, what am I getting this financed at? And a lot of those too are cash transactions. Tavon and I, we closed a $19.9 million manufacturing asset in Peoria earlier this year, where the buyer purchased the asset in 14 days, all cash closing. And we had, we had higher offers, um, from very reputable groups, but it was, it was, you know, the seller in that case made a conscious decision of, am I willing to give up, uh, on price, which was already uh, a great price for them that they were ecstatic with, uh, and was above our market guidance. Uh, to go take someone that was going to close in a very short period of time. So, and I think that's also what makes it, what makes it fun and, and interesting in, in the current environment. So you look at the past and, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's still a very, very strong market. And it was always, you know, pretty much always came down to the highest price. Uh, well, price matters now, but it's, it's even more so as to what are all the other factors there? Um, and, and that's where it really takes a, a very, um, a very, very talented advisor to be able to fully understand the circumstances with the buyer pool, uh, to help the seller, uh, make, make the best decision. And then where, you know, brokers are also working with buyers to make sure that, you know, their buyer clients are, uh, positioned to, uh, to be the most attractive and, and realistic and, and, and able to execute on, uh, on the transaction. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about the buy side and the sell side being really strong. Um, how, if you look at all of this in the leasing spec in sector as well, and in industrial specifically, um, with, with, I'm assuming space is pretty tight, right? Like you said, something goes on the market, multiple tenants are looking to get it, especially if, if, if it's a hotter area. Um, do you guys see like development maybe continuing then because of that? Or what, I, I guess my question is more so on the leasing side, but is that, is that driving everything 
more so. Just so many tenants out there looking for a smaller amount of space that's available. Yeah, I think so. And, and we'll talk about, I, I think, you know, what we haven't talked about, what's interesting, you know, it, tr- historically uh, with commercial real estate, um, you know, landlords are, are rewarded for having a long-term leased asset and cap rates are generally most aggressive. What we've seen in the last, you know, 18 months, two years is landlords are rewarded for shorter lease terms with, you know, mark-to-market rent opportunities. You know, kind of the the value add, you know, the near term value add uh, areas, and and that's because leasing has been so strong, and that uh, rents have been appreciating at massive levels. At, at some level, you have to look at what is the overall affordability of an asset. What can companies afford to pay? But real estate, while it's a huge line item, is is still uh, is still relatively low cost. Uh, yeah, but people do need to be cognizant of labor costs are rising, trucking costs are rising, real estate costs are rising. So, you know, there's a lot of factors there and need to be sensitive to it. I, you know, it, it, development is, is a very market specific area. I think as long as the demand is there, the rent growth is there, um, you know, you could, you can, you get government approvals to build in a, in a relatively short period of time. Um, you know, there's still a lot of backlogs on uh, different materials and, and labor. And what a changing market condition may do is actually improve some of those backlogs and make that stuff more accessible from a development standpoint. So I, I think that we're still going to see uh, a, a robust development pipeline and uh, different developers have different expectations. Some emergent developers, which means they're going to build a product and immediately sell it for profit. Others are going to build uh, to hold midterm or long-term. So, you know, those, those trends are going to continue. Uh, people will be disciplined. Are there borrowing costs for construction debt? You know, how, how is that going up? Uh, are land costs still going up? Our construction material costs still going up. So all those, all those items come in, you know, what, what is, where's the rent growth going to be? What, what can they now project as the exit cap rate, whether they're going to sell or what are they going to be able to refinance at? All those factors come into play. Uh, so some groups are going to say, sure, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a pause, but you know, there's already demand, uh, far outpaced uh, supply from those looking to get into the development standpoint. So even if some people, uh, back out, uh, there's still, there's still a, a, a very long list of people that are already in markets looking to develop and, and people that are looking to come into markets to develop. Yeah. And I would add to that too. It's, it's a, it's a fine line with, with development and oversupply and it's a direct correlation to tenant demand. And there is true tenant demand still in today's market. And I think there's a nice short term horizon there, like three to five years that that's going to continue to progress. Now, the, the biggest outside factor that none of us on this podcast can control is what the Fed does and how far the Fed over overcorrects inflation, right? Let's get, I mean, when has the Fed ever done anything right? I mean, I don't know, maybe a couple of times, but uh, not to get political or you know, economical, but right. But, but they can push us into a deeper recession, right? The cost of capital doesn't just affect, you know, lending costs for real estate investors and it also affects companies. Right. And so if there's a a true cooling off in our economy that that's experienced at a greater level than what I think everybody would anticipate this cycle, but no, I don't think anybody's anticipating this cycle being a massive recession, like the, the GFC great financial crisis, right? Or anything that predated that. So, you know, as, as long as they land the ship, you know, I won't say smoothly because I don't think they can do that, but just, you know, not, you know, break a wing off, but kind of bump the tires a little bit. I think we'll be just fine. Yeah, no, that I, I hear what you guys are saying for sure. That, unfortunately, the crystal ball can't foresee all that, but uh, I, 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 I definitely agree there. Um, it's interesting to hear too about the tenant side of things you guys bring up because I feel like, you know, it people assume going into the recession that tenants are going to have, like you said, the trickle down effect. Tenants 
buyers or not buyers, but consumers buying goods and things like that. Like, is this all going to have a mass effect on everything, which goes back into the whole circle side of things, right? It, it goes through the whole cycle, but the last time I checked the, the consumer spending data was still strong. So let's go America. Let's go, man. Let's go. No, I like it. Um, do you, I mean, so last, I guess on the tenant side of things that, too. That, when was the last time you went out to dinner? Try to book a restaurant. Last gotta, Saturday. If you, if you want to, if you want to go on a date in Phoenix, you got to book a restaurant three, three weeks in advance. So if that gives you what, what kind of demand on consumer spending there is in our local economy, it's pretty strong. I'll tell you guys, Chicago's the same way, you know, the, the ice defrosted probably 30 days ago, maybe 45 days ago. And yeah, everything, everything downtown, no matter where you're at is, it's hard to get into. That's for sure. So it, it doesn't, uh, although the gas prices, you know, maybe that'll, maybe that'll have a hindrance on people, public transportation. We, you know, maybe we look into that going forward. I don't know, but yeah. That's, that's a good way to look at it. That's a good gauge on the economy, right? I Restaurants so. are busy. Restaurants are busy. Um, so look, I guess, uh, you know, get back on track here, like current, I, I guess, you know, the crystal ball thing, why don't we go there guys? Cause I, I, I kind of like that, that side of it. Um, if you look at the crystal ball, what advice would you give to a fellow broker or a broker looking to get in the industrial space, right? Let's say I'm coming out of college and I want to get into commercial and industrial is really hot. Is any advice you give to people from, from that side of things or, or a fellow broker looking to switch it over into that sector? I mean, look, to me, it doesn't matter what, what sector, but you, you gotta be passionate about it. Right. And if you're not okay. passionate about what you do, and Tavon alluded on that earlier, right. If you're not passionate about what you do, you're not going to be successful. So it, it kind of starts there. Like right? what's your core fire telling you internally and, and what do you want to do and be great at, right. And what career path do you want to go down? I think, you know, being at multiple firms that have, that have all been publicly traded colors international. Jones Lang LaSalle and now at Marks and Milchap with their IPA division, you know, what, what would have been really helpful for me was aligning with a company that truly assists in that training process early on and provides real mentorship and guidance and coaching. I haven't been at a firm that does that other than Marks and Milchap and IPA. We're on, we're on coaching calls with senior executives talking about these types of things in the economy and different approaches and messaging, right? And then from like being earlier on in your career, just how to get started. What, what do I do? How, how do I become a true commercial real estate advisor? Where a lot of the other companies, they'll hire you, they'll give you a desk and a phone, and then they kind of walk away and say, figure it out, or, you know, try to align yourself with somebody and maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't, or they'll start you in like research and then they'll make you like an analyst and then they'll put you in an analyst role for three years. And then they might give you a chance at, you know, being a commercial real estate advisor. But, you know, I don't think that that's the necessarily pathway for, you know, guys coming out of college, you know, they're, they're smart, they're sophisticated, they're learning new technologies that I didn't learn to be more efficient in their business process that are hundred percent adaptable in this, in this environment and nothing's easy, right? Nothing's easy in being a commercial real estate advisor or getting into commercial real estate development or getting into asset management or on an acquisition team with a institution or family office, right? Not, not one of those roles is easy. You know, our, our jobs are difficult. You know, we work hard, we play hard, we have a lot of fun, but you know, the, the, you got to put the work in to, to build a clientele base, to have an established, you know, relationships and relationships take time, right? People like to do business with people they know that they trust that they have proven themselves for them on a repeat, repeated basis. I think what's also exciting is that, you know, it's, it, it seems like it's easy and people think it's a lot easier when the market's just humming along and when there's transition, that's when it matters even more so to be aligned with a good advisor, because we know all the ins and outs of what's going on in the marketplace, how it's moving from day to day. And it's moving at a 
very rapid, quick pace out there. And there's some brokers that don't uh, fully know or have a sense of where things are. So it's 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 where you know you can you can join the business in good times and bad. My personal philosophy, I think it's it's the best time to get in when it's a dynamic, challenging environment uh, because you're able to show how you can really help your clients um, and you can prove your stripes. I mean, just looking back, I mean, when Peter and I uh, teamed up, it was uh, in the you know the early 2010s in the great financial crisis. You know, I, I started in this industry, it's hard to believe, almost 20 years ago in, in 2004. And I moved back to Phoenix where I grew up and I love the quality of life in uh, 2011. And and Phoenix was, uh, the market was just crickets. It was dead. It was in the depths of the financial crisis. And, you know, I always think that's the best time to get in because, you know, how do you prove yourself? You prove yourself when nothing's going on in the marketplace and you can you can find people opportunities, you can deliver value, you can be someone who was able to offer insight and uh, really guide people along. So, you know, it's, it's you know, the market can continue to hum along and be fantastic for decades to come, or we might have some turmoil. I mean, there's a lot of factors that are outside of everyone's control um, in the industry, but you gotta be resilient, you gotta adapt, you gotta put in the hard effort, energy, you gotta be committed. Um, you got to be willing to hear no a lot of times, uh, and you got to be a leader. You got to be an expert in your craft. Uh, you got to be continuously learning. You got to be passionate. And, uh, those, those characteristics, you know, it it can't be taught. You have to, you have to do it. You have to be committed to it. And that's what makes our job fun. It makes it dynamic. There's always interesting new things. And, you know, that's why we enjoy helping our clients. And I would, I would add to that too. It's why I made a lot of great points there. You know, not only aligning yourself with a mentor and a team is important early on in your career, but also aligning yourself with a company. I mean, what what's amazing to me is the amount of knowledge that Marks and Millichap and IPA presents and publicly faces. Hassan Naji, our CEO, is constantly on on TV and uh, different TV and different media resources communicating about what is happening in 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 the economy and the environment we put out research reports you know lately it's been on a weekly or every other other week basis just with the fluctuations and what's going on and that that assists advisors like Tavon and I and to be able to communicate that message out to our client inviting them to webinars that are hosted by our our head of research or by Nassam himself, or even by Al Pontius, who runs our industrial and office division, right? Like, I, I have never worked at another company that has that type of knowledge and is constantly pushing it out on a regular basis. Other companies do quarterly reports. They'll do like a monthly market update, but not at the level that that this firm is, is pushing out information. It's fascinating. And it helps keep me educated. Yeah, I just want to echo Peter. I mean, and John Chang, who heads up our research services. I mean, if you go back, you look at the depths of, um, you know, during the pandemic and you look at early on and throughout when the world shut down. I mean, it seems like eons ago at this point. But, you know, Mark Similchap and and IPA was out constantly doing, um, constantly doing, uh, you know, podcasts like this, sessions like this, and, and informing the marketplace where I felt like a lot of other uh, groups in the industry just just hid and, you know, weren't looking for ways out. And that's that's what's exciting about this organization is it's, you know, things could be good, things could be bad, things could be in the middle, but we're going to be out there and we're going to tell it like it is. And we're going to be sharing our expertise. We're going to have other people in the industry out there with us talking about it. And I think that that's helpful for, you know, your, your small private capital investor, uh, your large private capital investor, your family office and for, for fellow institutions. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's a testament to the organization and, and being able to amalgamate all the information and to be open and to, to share it with our peers and the universe out there so that everyone can be successful. 
Oh, that was good, guys. Uh, you guys are out there and telling it like it is. I, I couldn't say it any better myself. That's uh, that's the only way to go, right? That that's it. That's how you got to do it. And people trust you guys, and they want to come back. That that's for sure. Um, I like that a lot. And you know, I, I don't know. You kind of answered this a little bit, but I, I was going to say too, like it, advice to give to investors right now for the space too. I mean, I know we talked about it a lot, but any I know on the crystal ball side of things, any any advice for the next you know coming years on that front? I would say on the hard to, to answer. Yeah, I mean, not really crystal ball, but like to investors today in the near term, right? Values for industrial property are still at historical highs, right? And and low cap rates, right? The environment is changing. You can still monetize your property today and make a great return for yourself. And and through that process, if the market continues to soften, there's other asset classes out there that you can get at a significantly higher yield due to different fundamentals. And, you know, I think the reality is, is the market's going to fluctuate in various cycles. And if you don't have a business plan with your asset, if it's, you know, you, you need to have a business plan, right? It's, it's like any investment. Well, what, where, where's my exit? What's my return? What's my return on equity? What type of IRR did I hit on this? Right. What, what could I utilize these proceeds to, and then go repeat that again. And that's, that's how you build generational wealth. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's truly finding the plan, listening to your advisor and executing on the plan. Devon and I help multiple investors help, help them build business plans around different assets, that, assets that they own, and then what, what to assist them to acquire next and, and work on that model. I think in this environment too, as interest rates rise, as debt costs change, the landscape shifts, it adjusts, it morphs, and it, it changes from day to day. And so it, it creates more opportunity and, uh, it's a great time to, to be in the game. And if you're on the sidelines, you're missing out. So it's constantly being in communication you know, with us, with understanding where opportunities are, um, where, you know, where, where someone can get in, uh, there might be pricing that they can get in now that they couldn't get in before. So, you know, it's, it's an exciting time and there's, there's plenty of opportunity around. I mean, there's, there's constantly opportunity in, in good markets and, and bad markets, however you define it. And different investors have different return hurdles and, and expectations and business plans to what Peter was saying. So there's, there's constantly opportunity. Uh, it's an efficient marketplace and it's a marketplace that's, that's open and that is, is very liquid. Like it guys that, uh, that makes me feel good about where everything's going. That that's for certain. That's for certain. Um, look, we've been, we've been going here for a while now, so I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, I, I typically ask, you know, a question here completely off topic, but any podcast or books you'd recommend doesn't have to be CRE related. Anything you'd like to share is a good listen for, for anybody out there. Fine, you take this one. So I I don't I don't listen to podcasts much. I've been trying to get into a couple. Some of my associate team members, they're from a, a younger generation than I am, and they'll send me stuff. I'll check it out. You know, I'm a guy that likes to go trail running. I like to get, I like to get deep in the mountains and I don't like to hear stuff when I'm doing that. I like to be out in nature. You know, if I, if I'm lifting weights in the garage, I like to play some music from the nineties and let it rip. So I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed cause I don't have a great answer to this. I was a history major at Penn. I, I love to read. Um, but I think, you know, where it comes down to is. You know, I've, I've got a great passion. I've got a great team. Um, I've got a great business partner. And and we spend a lot of time here at the office. And, and when I'm not at the office, I've got a great family, three kids, uh, a wonderful wife. And so um, I don't have a lot of free time to uh, do a lot of external reading and podcasts. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have any insight there. But my answer there is, you know, be, be passionate. Be passionate with your time. Be passionate with what you like, constantly be out learning, seek out. Uh, so I don't have a specific, you know, book to read or podcast to listen to, but 
you know, just, just go out and find where your interests and your passions are and dedicate yourself to them. Yeah. And, I love and, those and, answers, and guys. One, one last thing I would add to that, you know, is enjoy life, work hard and appreciate people, right? Like that's, I mean, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, I spend time with my family. I, I got two kids. I love the time that I get to spend with them. I love spending the time that I get to spend with Devon and, and our whole team, right? Like we have a lot of fun w- with what we do. We take everything very seriously. And when it's time to have fun, we have a lot of fun. I love it, gents. I, I love, I love those answers. Oh, no, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, we're, and we're recording this a few days before the 4th of July. Uh, so throw that out there. Any, any big plans Hopefully, there's some big firework shows re- where you guys are at, but, um, yeah, that's, you know, let's go have some fun. That that's for sure. Um, and, and, and anything that we missed on that you guys want to give a shout out to feel free before, uh, before we get into closing remarks here. I, I just want to, I just want to wish everyone a happy fourth. Uh, I, I just want to congratulate everyone on the Crexy team. Uh, you guys have just a, a great innovative product. I think it's, it's revolutionized the way a lot of transactions uh, get completed. So I love seeing the success that, that you've had and the growth that you've had. Um, and I'm just excited for, you know, everyone in the industry. We wish everyone tremendous success. Uh, we wish everyone, you know, just good health and happiness. And we're here to help anyone in any capacity. Absolutely. Love that, Timon. You know, if, if anybody knows me, they know I, I, I love our country. Like, I love the United States. I spent three years of my life living in West Africa, and I could not believe how much I love the United States of America. So the 4th of July is a huge holiday for me. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking it off with my kids and my family. <laughs> we're going to have a little beach time, get out of the heat. And uh, we're going to enjoy that. So, you know, just crack say I love what you guys do. Really appreciate you guys having us on. Thanks to all our clients out there. And, you know, everybody just find those opportunities, have fun, and enjoy what you're doing. Love it, guys. Thank, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's always great to hear your insights, especially on such a timely, you know, topic and, and important subject matters here. Uh, I know you guys are busy, so really appreciate it. Last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say for, for everyone out there, um, where can people find you guys? If they want to connect with you. You can let you throw your email address out there, throw your phone number, whatever's best. Yeah. So, uh, Tavon and I are both on LinkedIn real easy. Peter Bauman, you look up Tavon Moffitt, you'll find us. You can go to Marks and Middlechap's website. You can go to institutional property advisors website. Our email address is first initial last name at IPA usa.com and call us on the office and call us on the cell we're we're here we're here to help here to help i love it awesome guys this this has been a lot of fun absolutely we always love seeing you and uh again congrats on all the 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 success and growth with crack seed we love we love seeing it love all the the innovation of the products that you're bringing out it's, it's been too long since we've hung out, guys. We got we're gonna have to do it in person next time we do this. We'll do the podcast in person for sure. So we'll uh, we'll put that on the radar now. Um, but yeah, thanks again, and thanks everyone who tuned in, tuned in today. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexy.com slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite app and check us out on the YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care, and as we all said, have a great Independence Day weekend, everybody. 